His growing up years were in a crime-filled neighborhood. There were drugs, alcohol, domestic violence, included his dad pointing a loaded gun at his head. Steve Bainbridge's life was filled with hate, anger. He was raging inside and even started to hang out with a fanatical racist group of skinheads. Steve, welcome to the program. Hey, thank you, thank you. So you're growing up in a difficult area in Scarborough. It's a housing project. Tell me about your life. How, why, did, why did things get so angry for you? Life was tough. I mean, poverty was not only financial, it was uh, spiritual, it was just a broken home. And with the pressures of having your alcoholic father and mother constantly fighting, not having enough to buy food or proper clothes, and then you have the neighborhood kids beating on you all the time, being bullied, eventually you just get into this place of absolute, I hate the world. And that's just continued to be poured on. Uh, my dad, also a very racist man, um, he was not a very kind man earlier on in life and just putting those things on me day in and day out. So you grow up to start to realize if I'm going to get by in this world, I'm going to have to have hate. I'm going to have to find a way to survive. And unfortunately, that's, that's what came to. Was that just kind of normal then? Was everybody else kind of just, you know, kind of filled with hate and beating up on each other? And if you didn't want to get yeah. beat up on? I don't know. I mean, the street that I grew up on is famous. That's where the mass shooting happened a mm -hmm. few years back. Uh, back then, I was the target of the bullies. I was the target of the street kids taking advantage of, you know, my situation in life, probably just being kids. But my home was unique. Uh, it was broken. It was dysfunctional. I can't speak for everyone else, but for my, my end, it was really bad. So get involved with some skinheads. I mean, that sounds pretty radical. Yeah. What was that? Were you just trying to find a community somewhere? I was just trying to fit in. I mean, you know, I'm growing in high school, the same kind of situation is occurring. I finally get to high school, but again, no money, no job. My dad's not working, this pain. And all of a sudden you meet these guys who try to build into you. You're something special. You know, you shouldn't be treated like this. Oh, I kind of like those kind of things. I'm a young teenager. I don't know any better. But now all of a sudden I'm getting attention in a way I've never got it before. Did you at any point think that was maybe wrong though? Not really, because my dad and my upbringing, I mean, alcohol, booze, drugs, cursing, swearing, I mean, it was part of my home. Um, the feeling inside my stomach was, this is kind of extreme. Um, there were certain things that I've said, even to this day, I know I'm covered in the blood, I know I'm forgiven, but I still, I have a hard time coming to grips with some of the views I've held. It's very, still very embarrassing for me. So you're a pretty broken guy. You're getting into trouble, vandalism, crime, drugs. I mean, at any point, uh, were you fearing for your life that this might end in a tragic way? I didn't care. I, I did not care. Um, I, didn't, I didn't think I'd ever make it to 30, never mind 20. Um, unfortunately, because of the decisions I made, I got in some hot water. Um, but it was the day that my dad held the gun to my head. It was enough to have a gun to my head. But when I pulled the bolt back and I saw that there were shells in it, um, that was my decision to leave. How old were you? 15, 16 years of age, yeah, I was pretty young. And um, I remember my friend gave me 50 bucks to get out of town, I jumped on the Ontario Northland and I headed out of town. Um, but unfortunately I wasn't a Christian and the, the problem still found me. My mom and dad were in there, you know, um, doing their thing. She got remarried, uh, so she marries this man who they end up becoming uh, saved. They start going to a church in Barrie. They came to Christ. They or? came to Christ, yes. And uh, so they saw the trouble that I was in. They saw the damage I was in, and they said, let's go camping. And that's how I ended up at the Silver Birches uh, Pentecostal camp in way northern Ontario. And for the first time in my life, there's these kids, they're talking about Jesus, you know, Jesus loves you. Um, you need to ask Jesus into your heart, like this, this Jesus. Like, Did you have any concept you know, at that time, Steve, about Jesus other than maybe as a curse word? Uh, as a curse word, you know, and here's these kids talking about Jesus. And so I was intrigued as a young kid, but I had, I had too much pain. I had too much hurt. So I call it my experience up at the camp. I tried to make a decision. I tried to see what was going on. It didn't happen. And when I went back home, all the pain, all the problems started up again. When though then did you say, okay, that enough is enough. Uh, yeah. I want to, I, I guess it's kind of factored into this lady that you've been married to yes. for 17 years named Christine. Yes, yes. Tell me about that. So I'm, I'm living up north and I walk home one day and there is the most beautiful woman I've ever laid eyes on. And she is there with this smile on her face. And she was a Christian at the time. 
And I remember looking at her, trying to find a way to talk with her. And when she left the house, I looked at all my friends and I said, I'm gonna marry that girl one day. Now, my wife says, if I would have known you said that, I never would have let you marry me just to prove you wrong. <laughs> but um, I just knew. And so I started hanging around Christine. Well, Christine hung around my mother. So there's this Christian influence that is taking place. And so as I'm hanging out with her, we're going on some car rides. We're going back to the city of Scarborough. And I remember one day looking at my back window. So I went back to Danzig. I'm looking at this window. I'm remembering the beatings, the poverty, oh. the booze, the police ripping my mom and dad apart. I'm, I'm thinking of it all. And I wish it was a better testimony at that time, but I just remember looking, okay, if, if a chick can do it, I can do it. <laughs> that, that's my testimony. Hey, whatever it And works. I remember I yeah. took my cigarette out of my mouth and I flicked it. But that was the, just the first half. That started me becoming more morally Christian. I, I, had, I didn't have a desire to read the Bible. I didn't really have a desire to be all in. It was later on, about a year later, and I remember watching an episode called True and False Conversions by Ray Comfort and Kirk Cameron, yeah, that way yeah, the master yeah, program. Yeah, for sure, yeah. When I was watching that, I started to shake. And I'm like, okay, I've had an experience with Jesus, but I'm not in yet. I'm not sold out yet. So you were kind of getting your behavior or trying to get your behavior there, which we know is, of course, very difficult yes. until you make that relationship decision with Jesus. So when did you finally say, okay, Jesus, I give up. I can't do this. It's Amen. on you now. It was that day I watched the episode. I got up, I walked to the back washroom, and I say that I've hit the floor so hard the tile should have broke or my knees should have shattered. And I said, Jesus, I am in. Thank you for the cross. I understood the cross. Thank you that you lived the perfect life, that you are the one, and by your merit, I can be saved. Whatever you want of me, I'm done, I'm in. Wow. And that was the lift. I know you're all, that, and that's part of your story. You're yes. all in. but. Marriage still had some rocky points, uh, you know, with, you know, as most married couples will yes. have. So it, it wasn't just clear sailing. No, I mean, every marriage comes with baggage. We all have different backgrounds. And my wife and I, we've had to go through a lot of things. Mine was anger growing up in that environment and trying to overcome those things. But in our marriage, we continue to grow because we understand it's all about Christ. And that's just one of my most favorite verses is 1 John 4.10. In this is love, not that we loved God. He loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sin. Yeah. And so we understand we're broken. We're sinners. We can get through this and we just, that's how our marriage has been strengthened. And you've had to understand grace because of your past. Yes. If it wasn't for my past, I don't think I would understand grace as well as I do. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Steve. I appreciate your story. Um, you're also working with us here at uh, 100 Huntley Street on the prayer line. Yes. So thank you for your work yes. there. We'll have to have another conversation about, we the will. about the amazing things in your pastoring in Mississauga here. So thank you again for your amazing life. And, and as Steve has talked about, you know, it's not, for some, it's not an easy fix. There's still things that we have to deal with. So don't put a lot of pressure on yourself, but you do need to understand the grace and mercy of God. Always people standing by, like Steve and others, at 1-866-273-4444. We'll be right back.